Our scripture this evening is in Psalm 32. Uh, thankfully, I got that right. In my notes, I wrote Psalm 34. Uh, and Brian just wanted to make sure he was putting the right text up on the uh, on the screen because it's not like I've ever announced one thing and then read something completely different. Okay. Uh, this sermon will be a little bit different as, as I was reading through the Psalms this week and I read this Psalm, God just kept speaking to me about this Psalm and and, and I'm really excited about what God wants to say to us in this psalm. Now, I just want you to know this, this sermon will be a little bit more of an evangelistic sermon than we normally would preach during a Sunday evening service. But that's okay, right? Uh, we all need to hear the good news from time to time. And, and who knows but that somebody is watching us tonight that God has brought onto our website. I was telling Angie the other day, we, we had a, uh, a lady from a town that, that my mom spent some time in. My papa pastored there uh, during his ministry that was watching our service. And I thought, how in the world did this person find uh, our website but, uh, and, and our feed? But we're so thankful that they did. And again, if you're watching us online, we're just so thankful about that. See, beloved, the point that God is making in Psalm 32 is that if we will come home, God will surround us with songs of deliverance. Now, listen to me. Some of us just heard, if we will come home, just heard me say, if we will get saved, and certainly that's part of it. Certainly that is part of it. And we're going to see in a few moments when and why this psalm was written. But I want you to understand as you have opened your Bibles and you see that this is a psalm of David. And David is showing us the pathway home. And as we read this text, I want you to listen, especially in the the first four verses, and see if something doesn't uh, sound familiar. Psalm 32. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. See if you've ever been here. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. 
Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word. And and God, we're just so thankful that you laid on David's heart, that you illumined him. And Lord, we pray that as you illumined his heart and mind, when you gave to him this perfect and infallible word from you, that you would illumine our hearts and minds as well. God, we love you so much. We offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. In and through the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Master. Amen. There are times that when, for all of us, a secret that we thought we had hidden well, that we had covered it up well, gets out. People know what's going on. To be honest, they've known all along, and we just were deluding ourselves to keep it secret. When I was in 8th grade, I was not the most stellar student in the world. I went to Newport Grammar School, and both of my parents taught in the Cock County school system. Mama at calls being Daddy at Edgemont. And so I'd gotten a report card that was less than a blessing, if you catch my drift. And so when I came home and and Mom and Daddy asked me where my grade card was, I said, oh, well, they didn't give them out today. (laughs) The next day, where's your grade card? Oh, I don't know. There's some kind of problem that they're having with them. And they didn't give them out today. See, I knew I was going to get grounded as soon as they saw my grade card. I tried to string that thing out for about a week. Mom and Daddy knew full well when when my grade card had come out. (laughs) Do you know how miserable that week was? Every time the phone rang, every time somebody came to the door, or I heard Mom and Daddy walking down the hall, oh, they found out. (laughs) The jig is up. Isn't that what David is describing in our text this evening? Now let me give you the context, and we'll talk more about the context in a few moments. The context of this is can be summed up in one word, Bathsheba. That's the context. And we're going to see what David tried to do with this thing for a long time. But when we're trying to to hide all of that, verse 3, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. You ever been there? You ever been to that place where God Almighty wants to deal with you and you don't want to deal with Him? Hmm. God wants to deal with something in your life, but you're not quite ready to deal with it yet. As I mentioned this morning, let me explain something about the Psalms to you. The Psalms are inviting you. They are an invitation to bring all of you to God. Not just your son to you. Not just your going to church you. You know, I'm old enough to remember that that what this, what I'm wearing right now, would be referred to as what? My Sunday go to meeting clothes. I don't wear this to work. Okay? I don't wear this anywhere else but but to church. God, listen, God is inviting us through the Psalms. To bring all of us to Him. 
He is showing us that there is not an emotion that we can have. There is not a problem in our lives that we can create that He can't deal with. The Psalms say, do not hide. Bring every part of yourself to God. Why is that? We said all along that the Psalms were hymns. And we also have said a couple of times, but we, we certainly mentioned it last Sunday night, that when the New Testament quotes any part of the Old Testament, but especially when it quotes a psalm, that the speaker or the writer wants you to bring that entire psalm or that entire event, that entire text into your mind. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of things. Listen, I know some teachers don't particularly care for this, but why do we teach our children A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Because it's easy to remember. It's been set to music. It has a rhythm and a meter to it. It stands out in our mind as we're trying to memorize something that's really important to us. And the Psalms are doing the same thing. Let's do a little bit of a thought exercise. Surrounded by your glory. How many of y'all already know where I'm going? What will my heart feel? Now, most of you already know where I'm going. Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? Come on now. I can only imagine. Now, for everybody in this room, we know that song. And I can even tell you where I was the first time I heard that song. I had gone up to Southern Seminary on one of my J terms. This was back during the time when a third of my hours in seminary had to be done on campus. And so to make that possible for those of us that were uh, not uh, close to the seminary, they had J terms that met during months that begin with a J, January, June, and July. And so I'd gone up there, and a dear brother of mine from our center in Maryville, uh, Mercy Me, had just released that album. And, and I was in the bookstore looking at books. And he came running up to me and says, Larry, you have got to listen to this album from this new band. And, and I bought the CD. And I listened to it on my way home from seminary when I was coming home for the weekend. And it ministered to my soul because it ushered me into the very presence of Jesus. Let's try another one. Here I am, Lord, and I'm drowning in your sea of forgetfulness. The chains of yesterday surround me and I yearn for peace and rest. I don't want to end up where you found me. And it echoes in my mind, keeps me awake tonight. I know you've cast my sin as far as the east is from the west. And I stand before you now as though I've never sinned. But today I feel like I'm just one mistake away from you leaving me this way. Jesus, can you show me just how far the east is from the west? Because I can't bear to see the man I've been come rising up in me again. In the arms of your mercy I find rest. Because you know just how far the east is from the west. From one scarred hand to another. And for many of us, that song just ushered us to the foot of the cross. And we're watching our Savior writhe in agony 
over our sin. My point here is that this maskil of David puts to music what all of us feel in our hearts. Luther called this psalm a Pauline psalm. Now, by that he didn't mean that Paul wrote it. But he meant that this psalm really preaches and proclaims the free and unmerited grace of God towards sinners that Paul so clearly wrote about in books like Galatians and Ephesians and Romans. God offers His grace to us if we will just trust Him as our hiding place. Now again, let's let's lay down the fuller context. This psalm, as you see in your Bibles, was written by David. It is kind of a co-psalm with Psalm 51. The background of this psalm is 2 Samuel uh, uh, 12, or 11 and 12. We all know of David's adulterous relationship and his subsequent murder of Uriah. Now, for at least... Nine months, David lived with a quiet conscience. He thought he'd gotten away with it. He thought that by murdering Uriah and doing away with him, that that closed the circle, that there was only one other person in all of the world who knew what was going on. And that man was fiercely loyal to David and would never tell. And so David hid it. And he covered it up. And he pushed back the guilt and the shame. And he thought he'd gotten away with it. But then God forced the issue in 2 Samuel 12 when He sent a man named Nathan into David's presence. And Nathan said, Dave, can I tell you a little bit of a story? Can I I just tell you something? I've had this thing come up and I just want to get your take on it. And he tells that very familiar account of a rich man taking... A poor man's only lamb. And David is incensed. He's incensed. You know the sins we judge harshest in others? Our own. Our own. The ones that we think we're hiding from God effectively. The ones we think he doesn't know anything about because we're so good at camouflage and subterfuge. We all need Nathans in our life, don't we? Thou art the man. You're the one I'm talking about, David. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everything that David had worked so hard for. Everything that David had been walking on pins and needles about. What do you imagine it was like David, for David to walk through the city and see two of his soldiers in a private conversation as they watched their king walk through the streets? They know, don't they? Are they talking about me? Are they talking about me? They know. Somehow they know. It's all about to come out in in public. And so God forces David to have to deal with his sin. And as a result of that confrontation, David wrote Psalm 51 and then this psalm as a reflection on what he learned in Psalm 51. At the beginning of this psalm, it tells us that it's a masculine. 
a masculine. That word comes from the word for teaching. And so it's building upon David's promise that he made to God in Psalm 51, 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. And then he's done, right? Because we all know it's all about us. It's all about us. David understands it's not all about him. David understands who he is. David understands the position that God has placed him in. And David says that God, when you do that, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. What do you think would happen? If we saw that person that just flew all over us because of whatever particular sin they were committing that that was in our top two. And we all got one, beloved. Don't pretend we don't. We all got some. That we'll tolerate certain things. We'll even welcome some people that have committed some sin into our fellowship. But oh, if they've crossed a certain line in our mind, that's too far. Even God's grace doesn't extend there, we think, in our mind. What would happen, beloved, if if we took that verse and we saw that person transgressing? We're, We're going to talk about that word in just a minute. Transgressing God's way. And instead of coming up to him and saying, you know what, I hope you enjoy hell. Saying, you know, I I used to be right where you are. And I thought it was the most amazing thing in the world. I was having so much fun. Oh, you know, I just thought it was the greatest thing that's ever been. But then one day, A friend of mine introduced me to Jesus. And everything changed for me in the twinkling of an eye. And I'd just like to share with you for a moment if I could. What Jesus has done in my life. And see if he'll do the same thing in your life as well. Don't you think that's the way that sinners will be converted to God? Well, that's a whole other sermon. Anyway. So this is David's song about what God has done in his life. How many of us have written a song about our sin? Now I'm not saying we write a song to glorify our sin. But how many of us have written a song to teach transgressors God's ways so that sinners will be converted to him? And how many of us are trying to keep all of that uh, hidden and, and buried down so that everybody in the community will think we're all that in a bag of chips? Do you ever wake up and at a heart level and think, how did I get here? How did I get so far away How did I drift so far? How long has it been? All of us know the fatigue of pretending and posing and playing a game. We've all done it. We all know what it's like to wake up and feel like we're stuck in our failure. To feel like we're stuck in our life. And we're stuck with our shadows and with our secrets. And if that's where we are tonight, David is telling us how to get back home. 
verses 1 and 2. David begins the psalm by telling us, I want to take you down this long road that we've got to go on on the way home. And do you see how he begins? Confession. Godly sorrow. Paul quotes this verse in Romans 4, 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. It's sorrow because there's tears, because there's regrets, there's failure. But it's godly because David finally turns back to God. Notice that David uses three words in two verses for his and our sin. Transgression in verse 1 and sin and iniquity in verse 2. And that's the end of the story, isn't it? No, beloved. God also has three words in those verses. Forgiven, covered, and not counted. Hallelujah. We bring our sin. We bring our iniquity. We bring our transgression to Almighty God. And God says it is forgiven, it is covered, and it is not counted. God is telling us, grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace. Grace. God's grace. He's talking to us about God's amazing grace. I mean, listen. Anybody here in the... I mean, come on. Let's just be good Baptists and, 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 and rank sins. That's what we do. May as well be honest about it. So has anybody here ever committed adultery and then murdered the spouse of the person that you committed adultery with to cover it up? And then directly disobeyed a direct order from God? Well, most of us would say with Jesus' definition of what you just said, Yeah, been there and and done that. David is amazed that God would still reach out to him in grace. Now look at this with me. Transgression means our resistance to God, our rebellion. It means crossing the boundary. We're going to talk about the prodigal in, in, in a few I mean a few minutes. But I want you to think about that day. Hey, Dad. You know, it's just you're a good dad and all. I I, I really love you. But uh, farm life is just not for me. I am a city boy. And so What I was kindly hoping was, could you see your way clear to go ahead and give me my part of the inheritance? What did he just say? Dad, I'm already counting you as dead. I'm already counting you as dead. And so I'd like my money. And daddy gives it to him. Can you imagine what it was like for dad to watch his son, flush with money, walk away off into the horizon? And don't you imagine that he stood there for a good long time and watched him walk away Praying and praying and praying, God convict him. Bring him back. 
God, don't let him get into town and, and fall into all this riotous living. I've been to town a couple of times. I know what goes on there. And I don't want my boy involved in it. But it doesn't seem there's any way I'm going to be able to protect him from it. Sin, as you have heard, is a term, it's an archery term. It means missing the mark. It means that, that you're shooting at the target and you hit what we called in the Marine Corps the petticoat. In the Marine Corps, the petticoat is any part of the target that ain't the target. Okay, that's not what you're shooting at. If it's not black, it's the petticoat. And you don't get any points for that. It's completely missing the mark. It's missing what God has called us to aim at in our relationship with Him and with others. Now, with that definition of sin, how are we doing? How are we doing? How are we doing at, at hitting, or at least not getting the other term we had for it was Maggie's drawers? How good are we doing not getting Maggie's drawers and aiming at our relationship with God? Are we at least hitting the black part of the target? How are we doing in our relationships with others? Are we missing the mark? And then iniquity. Iniquity refers to how sin is a twisting. He is saying this is a twisting of my heart. Now listen to me carefully. He is saying, what happened to me is not a fluke. My adulterous relationship with Bathsheba was not a fluke. My then decision to have her husband murdered was not a fluke. It was not out of left field. It's actually very explainable. And the explanation is, is that my heart is corrupt. My heart is bent. My heart is twisted. And that's what David is saying in verse 1 and in verse 2. And then God responds with three words of grace. God first forgives our sin. God then covers our sin. And then God refuses to count our sin against us. And so there's not only removal of guilt that our sin is forgiven, but there is an obliteration of our past record. It's been covered and not counted. And so not only does God forgive me in the high court of heaven, No matter how deep, no matter how tall, no matter how wide my sin is. It's not only that God forgives me, that God has removed my guilt, but that the whole record of my guilt and my sin and my past performance has been taken out of my file and thrown away. It's as if it never happened to God. So then why do we keep hanging on to it? Verses 3 and 4. David tells us that he was holding this deep secret and was silent about it. And he tells us what it's like to hide sin. Anybody there right now? When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. You want me to stop just right there and give an altar call and go back to verses 1 and 2? Because, beloved, we've all spent time there. We've all spent time in verses 3 and 4. And some of us set up a base camp 
when we should have just been setting up an overnight camp. There's a thread that runs through Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 that runs through David here too. And it's a thread that runs through you and I as well. We spend so much time hiding. What did Adam and Eve do when God came looking for them? Listen, all of us remember the time when it was no longer cool or okay to be naked in front of our parents. Okay, there was just that day that came, and it's mom, dad. We didn't want that anymore. Adam and Eve hit that day when they began to sin. And when they heard God walking in the garden, they went and hid. Because they were afraid of being known. They were afraid of being found out. They were afraid of being in the light. And yet, listen to me. We all long for someone to come after us. Amen? Anybody in here tonight want to, to, to go off into a life of sin and us just to go, well, tell you what we're going to do to show you how much we care about you. We're going to disfellowship you. Because you had not been here in three Sundays. We all want somebody to come after us. We're longing for someone to pursue us, to bring us out of the dark, to bring us out of our hiding. Beloved, so much of the Christian life is actually believing verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 is the gospel in the Psalms. It's actually letting the voice of God speak to us and tell us what He wants to do. Now listen to me, beloved. There's another voice. Adam and Eve listened to it. And evidently Adam listened to it secondhand, didn't he? We have no record that Satan ever spoke directly to Adam. And so Adam got his knowledge about sin second hand. And you know what? That just blessed Satan to death. How many of you have ever had a job at work and you know you're kind of hanging on to it and, and you couldn't quite get it done and you walked in one day and it's done, somebody else had done it and you were like, ha, cool. Well, Satan got Eve to do his bidding and tell Adam about sin firsthand. David had been listening to that voice for at least nine months. How long have we been listening to that voice? That voice that tells us to go into hiding. To hide our light under a bushel basket. To not tell anyone lest they think less of us. But the voice of Jesus leads us out of that hiding that is wrecking our lives. We have to stop hiding. Verse 5. David confessed. And he got it off his chest. Now I want you to notice something. In your Bibles there was a Selah at the end of verse 4. And we've learned that Selah means to pause and reflect on what you just said. And so what David wants us to do at the end of verses 3 and 4 is to pause and weep and reflect on what sin has done to our lives. And then verse 5. Acknowledge your sin. Stop hiding your iniquity. Confess your transgression. And what does God do in response to that? And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Stop and think about that. This is the first John 4, 8 of the Old Testament, beloved. That if we will confess our sin, 
God is faithful and just to forgive us. Now, if you're a singer, or if you play an instrument, especially a woodwind, or something that you have to blow into, you know that very frequently before a, a lengthy or a dramatic part of the, of the music, the writer of the music will put a rest in the music. So that you can take a big breath to finish out the rest of the song or to finish this line. And so what David is doing in verse 5 is he's saying, I want you to take this big, deep breath and rest here for a moment before testifying to everyone that God is our hiding place. He preserves us from trouble and surrounds us with songs of deliverance. Do you know, you know, we sometimes think that up in heaven somewhere, God's got Himself a bottle of grace. And that there's a fixed amount of grace in that bottle. And that God, when He runs out, when that bottle runs empty, there's no more grace left for God to give out. But do you understand that God never runs out of grace? God doesn't have to ration out His grace to us so that when we call to Him, when we confess, there is immediate forgiveness. God doesn't have to say, well, now wait a minute, you wait right here, let me go try to find some grace. I think I left some over in the, over in the, the closet at, at cloud seven and, 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 and glory, hallelujah. There's immediate forgiveness. And the whole point of this psalm is that when we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin immediately. You are so preciously loved that He immediately forgives us. You are so preciously loved that you can name your failure that you can bring it to Jesus and you don't have to be good enough because He was. You just have to believe that He is good enough and there is nothing more to be done. There is the immediacy of the grace of God that's being promised here. Verses 6 through 11. David now turns what he's learned into teaching. He's saying don't be stubborn. You know, I worked at a stable for a while one summer. And I had this horse that I really, I really enjoyed. His name was Big Red. And Big Red was just, me and him got along just famously. And if I needed him to do something, I didn't have to whip him with the reins. I just had to take the reins and just gently lay him from one side of his neck to the other. And if I needed him to move one way or the other, I didn't even have to pull on his bridle. I'd just kind of tap him with my knee on his side. And he'd go the way I wanted him to go. That's the way God wants us to be with him. Instead of stubborn, instead of God having to put a bit in our mouth. And look at what God gives to us in verse 7. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. How many of y'all ever said something along these lines to your kids? When the law shows up, everybody's going to jail. Right? Some of it was don't get taken out with the garbage. But the best way to avoid trouble is to not walk with trouble. To walk with Jesus. And I want you to see a contrast. In verses 3 through 5, David is hiding from God. Do you understand that? He's hiding from God. In verse 7, what? You are my hiding place. Now he's hiding in God. There's another contrast. Verse 3. David didn't confess his sin. What did he do? 
He groaned. He groaned all day long. But verse 7, when he confessed his sin, shouts, songs of deliverance. And listen to me, beloved. Who's shouting? Who's singing here? God is. God is shouting and singing over David. Maybe you're here tonight and you failed. But you believe that God has forgiven you. You believe He's cleansed you. You believe He's obliterated your past record. And you even believe that He can be a hiding place for you. But you have trouble believing that He's not ashamed of you. You have trouble believing that He could have joy in you. That He could have gladness in you. Believer in Jesus, your Father loves you. You are His child. And He surrounds you with shouts and songs of deliverance. And so where are you tonight? That's the second question in the Bible, isn't it? Where are you? Where are you? Remember Luke 15, 20? We started with this. We talked about how the the prodigal's daddy watched him walk away into the distance. Here we are near the end of the story. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. How did daddy know? How did daddy know? He was out there every day. Every day. Searching the horizon. Waiting for his son to come home. Waiting for his son to return from his riotous living. He was waiting for him. And it's more than just waiting. Because the word says that when he saw him, He ran and embraced him. He was waiting for him. He was looking for him. And if he was looking for him, listen to me, there must have been a longing for him to come home. Where are you? If you feel tonight that you're a long way off, do you not know? Have you not heard? There is a song and a ring, and a robe for you. There is a calf being fattened just for you. There is a party about to start if you will just come home. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice and shout for joy because you are home.